session, we're going to break it in, out um, from the first two chapters of the book. And it's really um, learning how to pray from God's heart. But before we talk about that part, I want to just talk a little bit about my journey and how I got to where I am today. And so here we go. Um, I um, was always raised in church, loved God, and grew up. And um, several years ago, probably, wow, wow, like 30 years ago, we were pastoring a church in Weaverville, California, and we had a friend come through that w was, I would call him a prophet. And one of the things, he would come every year, and this one particular year, he was calling people forward to um, prophesy over them their gifts. And I was at that time raising babies and real involved in all of that, and uh, my life was absorbed with that. And he called me out that day. It was a Sunday morning service. I'll never, ever, ever forget it. He called me out, and I was actually sitting. We were having a church in the theater, and I was sitting in the balcony. And he called me down. And as I was walking down the aisle to get prayed over, I said this to God. God, I'll take any gift but intercession. And I have kind of a discerning gift, so I really kind of knew that that's what it was going to be. But inside, I'm like, oh, now, the, why would I say that? Because growing up in the church, um, the people that we would label intercessors or prophetic intercessors um, were a lot of the time just, to be honest with you, depressed. And they always seemed to be carrying some heavy burden on their shoulders, and you could see it all over their faces. And... And I just grew up thinking, I don't want to be like that. And so sure enough, when I got down to the front, the first words out of his mouth, he says, I see you as an intercessor. And he said, but not for this time, but there's a time coming. And when he said that part, I went, whew, I'll just put that thing up on the shelf and we'll just see what happens. And so I did. I just kind of put it on the shelf. And 18 years ago, um, I woke up one morning and the Lord spoke to me, and he, I felt like he said, I want you to carry joy and intercession. And my first question to him was, is that possible? Because of the way I had perceived it. And he said, I'm, I felt like he said, I'm going to take you on this journey, and I'm going to show you that it's possible to be joyful and be, be an intercessor. Now, I would not consider myself at that time to be an intercessor. I prayed. When I was a little girl, my mom said I asked for prayer for everything. Even when, the, when I was hurt, I would come and ask her to pray for me. And any of my friends in the neighborhood would get hurt. I'd have her praying for them. And it was always in me. But I would not consider myself an intercessor, and nor did I really understand it. And so I, I you know, like everyone else, I signed the bottom of an empty white page and said, yes, Jesus, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And so the Lord began to take me on this journey. But I had an encounter that I want to talk about. And this encounter happened in Toronto during the renewal time where the Father was coming with his great love and demonstrating it and showing it to people. And Bill and I went there, and it was a Sunday night service, and the service was over. And if you ever were at Toronto during the renewal time, Whenever the service ended, there were bodies everywhere. And God was touching people. They would get prayed for. They would fall on the floor. They would roll. I, maybe that's how we got the holy roller thing. You know, I remember as a little girl at the altar watching people do all that stuff and just being, mem you know, just like, wow. And uh, so this was happening in Toronto. And Bill and I were walking out, and we were up at the front, and we walked to the back of the church. And in the back of the church, it was this huge area. And seriously, there were bodies everywhere. They were just, they were getting touched by God. And I noticed that there was one gentleman walking around, and he was like stumbling drunk. Now, we, we call it being drunk in the spirit. And so when I say drunk, that's what I mean. And so that's what he was doing. And he was walking around touching people, and they would just, go a little crazy. 
And as, we, as Bill and I walked out, my arm was in his arm, and we walked, began to walk. And I noticed this gentleman, and that guy made contact with me, eye contact with me, and he beelined right towards me. Now, I was minding my own business. We were leaving. That was it. You know, nothing spectacular had happened to me or anything. And he headed towards me, got over to me, and just touched my arm. And when he touched my arm, I flew to the ground. And I began shaking violently all over the floor. Not just a little tremor. I was violent all over the floor. And my husband said he's never seen anything like it since. And I was in no control of my body, but I was in complete control of my thoughts. And I, I knew that this was God. I knew that it was sovereign. I knew that God was doing it, doing something, but I had no clue what was happening to me. And it went on for 20, 25 minutes. And at one point, a lady came over and said, are you in shape? Like, are you in good shape? And I was at the time, and I said, yes. And she goes, then more, Lord. And off I went again. And um, obviously, Bill had to let go of me. It was so violent. And about 20, 25 minutes into it, my parents were there also. And my dad and my husband helped me up off the floor, and we walked back to the hotel with me hanging on just like a limp noodle all the way back to the hotel, totally enveloped in God and loving every second of it. The next day, we got to the service, and I sat down. And a gentleman got up to speak in it. This, to this day, I don't remember who it was. And the first words out of his mouth, I went to the floor. And I just began weeping and weeping and weeping. You know how you have those experiences, and when you talk about them, they come back to you, and all that emotion just comes back, yeah. And I laid on the floor weeping, and I said, God, what happened to me yesterday? What were you doing? And this is what I felt like he said. He said, I was taking out of you the lies that you believed about yourself and birthing those things that were in you that I want you to be. Now, let me explain why. When I was a little girl, I still am, but when I was a little girl, I was labeled shy. And when you have a quiet spirit, that's what you get labeled a lot of times, is people just think you're shy and you don't have anything to say. And, and so I grew up with that. My parents didn't do that to me, but other people would do that to me, and they would just say, you're shy, you don't have anything to say, why don't you talk, don't talk, and all this. And so when you get when you get told that kind of stuff over and over again, that actually becomes, you become that. And so I became this shy person, very introverted, was not able to speak in public. Um, you know, growing up in school, I'd much rather take an F than have to get up and do any type of oral report. It was just terrifying to me. And that, I believe, that shyness became a stronghold over my life. And that, that night on the floor in Toronto, God shook that violently out of me because I needed to step into who I was. And so from then on, my husband says, I was a different person. I felt different. I felt this boldness come on me. I still had a quiet spirit, but I had this boldness come on me like I had never experienced before. I began uh, teaching Bible studies. We went home, and I started a women's Bible study, and we just had a rocking time. We just had a great time. We were in full-blown renewal, too, so it was just in an incredible time. Um, but what the one thing that I started experiencing in all of this is intimate times with the Lord. Now, like I said, I grew up loving God. I don't remember when I got saved, but I always loved God. But I had never fallen head over heels in love with the Holy Spirit like I had experienced in Toronto. And that continued. And I found myself just wanting to, to be with the Lord all the time, just spending time with Him all by myself in a secret place. And my kids were in high school at the time, so I would send them off to school, and I'd send Bill off to school, and I got to stay home at that time in my life, and I would put a worship CD on, and I would just get lost in the Lord. And that was my cradle, so to speak, of the birthing of intercession for me. And that intercession came from intimacy with the Lord.
I would find myself just uh, lost in his presence. And what I discovered was um, I would start seeing things in my mind, in my spirit, and I would experience things, and I would see people's faces, and I would see different countries, and, and I would begin to pray into situations, and I found myself just pretty much agreeing with what the Lord was showing me. I remember one time I was praying, and I saw a picture come up in my mind of an Asian man, and I'd never seen him before. I don't even know if I've seen him since, but all I knew is that the Lord was putting him before me, and I just began praying for him. And I don't remember what I prayed today, but I remember just praying for him. And that's what it was like. It was like I would spend this time with the Lord, and, and what was happening is I was getting his heartbeat. I was getting what he, his heartbeat was. And I like to describe it like this. It's kind of hard to describe it. When, when you move into that intimacy with the Lord, and then you move into intercession, you feel the heartbreak of God for a people, for a world, for a nation. And, but yet you feel the joy of the Lord in his great love for people also. And it's kind of like liquid love. You know, you have this intense for prayer for somebody, but yet there's this joy and there's this love that comes out of that too because you see what the Father wants to do. You see what he wants to accomplish. And so this became my life. And, and this would be hours of just spending time with the Lord. And, and while we were in that process, that Toronto process and stuff, we moved to here to Redding, California to pastor the church. And the Lord put me in contact with some old buddies that we had been when we had lived here earlier. And we had never been prayer partners together, but God put us together. And because of the renewal, we were all moving into this new adventure with God. And we would get together and have these soaking times, what we call them, where we just come before the Lord and we lay before the Lord. And we say, Lord, what do you want us to do? And, and we would just adore him and spend time with him. We would have group visions. That's really amazing, where everybody's seeing the same thing. And we would pray together, and it was just finding his heart and finding his heartbeat. There was a surgeon once that um, was doing surgery on a heart patient, and he took the bad heart out of the person's, and it was hooked up, and he had the live heart too, and he put them together, and at first they didn't beat together. And as they began to touch, they began to beat the same way. And that to me is such a perfect example of what happens when we enter into that secret place with the Lord is that our heartbeat becomes the same as his and it beats the same and we feel the same and we know what God is doing and that's it. That's what we need to do is find his heart. We become the womb of God. John 7.38 says, he who believes in me out of his innermost being will flow rivers, rivers of living water. That innermost being, that word innermost means womb. It's the womb of God. We become that womb of God. The womb is a place where things grow, creativeness, our intercessions declare and express. We carry the life of the kingdom within us. Luke 17.21 the kingdom of God is within you. It's in your hearts. To me, this is where it's all at, right here in the innermost being, innermost part, is where we speak to God and where we have fellowship with him. One of the things I tried to do, and I, I still try to do, is not have an agenda when I come before the Lord in that secret place. You know, there's a lot of pressures in life. There's a lot of things going on. We have a lot of needs just in our personal homes. And then we have needs from outside the home too as well. And we can really get taken up and wrapped up in those, which is good. But when I first come to the Lord and into his place, I purposely don't have an agenda. Sometimes I think that God might get sad because sometimes all we do is just ask him for stuff. When really... The first thing in our day, he just wants to be with us. I like the outdoors. I love to be outdoors. 
And I love to just go out in the mornings when it's beautiful weather, and I just like to look at this. I like to watch the sunrise. And I, now is my favorite time of the year because it's spring. Everybody's, everything's alive and blooming. And I like to just go out and sit with the Lord and just say, God, that is such a gorgeous flower right there. You just made something so beautiful. Look at the birds. Look what, they, look what they're doing. They're waking up the morning. They're nourishing the plants. I just like to enjoy God and what he's made for me to enjoy. That's, that's what God wants us to do. Everything else is great. But come God with no agenda and just adore him, I really think he likes that a lot. It's really important that we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit and move with him. If we come with our own agenda, we have a tendency to, this is what I want, God, this is what I need. And sometimes we'll miss the whole thing that the Holy Spirit is wanting to do that day. Can you wake up in the morning and say, Holy Spirit, what do you want to do today? Even if you've got a big, busy schedule, Lord, what do you want to do with that big, busy schedule? I'm all yours today. That's how I feel like we need to come to God and enter into his heart. You know, when I pray for people, I do this as a practice. They'll come to me and ask for prayer, and I'll say, you know, what do you need prayer for? And they'll tell me, and then I put my hands on them, and I say, Holy Spirit, would you come and show us how to pray? And I found that sometimes what they're asking for, God is going to bring the answer through another way. In other words, when I say, Holy Spirit, come and show us how to pray, sometimes it's different than what the person is asking for. So we'll pray that, and that becomes their answer, which answers what they ask for. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you want to be really sensitive to that. God actually likes our ideas, too. That's what I've discovered. I like his ideas. His are always the best. But I think that when we come into a communion with God, that he likes our ideas, too, as well. Why don't we turn to 1 Kings chapter 8. If you have your Bibles. And this is the story of David, one of the stories of David. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 18. And this is Solomon talking and this is what he says, But the Lord said to my father David, Whereas it was in your heart to build a temple for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. I like that verse because it was like God was saying, David, I chose you. And there's another verse in here that says that God chose David. And it was in David's heart to build the temple. Although his son eventually ended, built the temple, it was in David's heart. It was David's idea. God chose David, and J David chose to build a temple. And I think that's just pretty cool, is that when we become friends with God, God wants to hear our ideas. And if our desires and ideas are sanctified in him, if we're on an ongoing relationship with him, he likes to hear what we have in mind. You know, when I pr take prayer trips and stuff, I take them all over the world, Um. Sometimes the stuff I get is from God, and sometimes it's just my ideas that he just like, that's really good. You can go do that. That'd be great. And that's the joy of fellowship. That's the joy of knowing what his heart is. And that's the adventure that we're on. We're on this incredible adventure to walk with God and to be in partnership with him. Moses was a great friend of God. God called him his friend. Their relationship was so interesting. We're going to talk about it later. But their, their, their relationship was so interesting because those two, God and Moses could, they argued. Which is amazing to me that Moses would argue with God. But they had such a close relationship that God was okay with that. And in one story, Moses actually changed the mind of God. And we'll talk about that later too. <clears throat> so 
So the heart of God is deep and is wide and is waiting for us to discover it. I want to do this. This is a little spontaneous, but let's do this. Let's just close our eyes and let's just practice his presence right now. Holy Spirit, just come. And we want to just practice your presence and what you're doing. Put us into your heart, Father. Thank you, Lord. If there's things that you're pondering right now, just take a moment and just talk to God about that. Just talk to God about that and then just ask him, God, what, what do you think about that? What's in your heart for that? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We could stay here for a long time and do this. But this year, um, the Lord spoke to me when I was pondering like this, and I was just spending time with him. And I said, Lord, I've got something that we have been praying for as a family for 30 years, and your promise is still true to do that. How do you want me to pray? You know, because sometimes our prayers get, like, boring or rancid, if that makes sense. It's like we keep praying the same thing over and over again for the same thing, and it doesn't seem to, nothing's working. So I like to ask God, God, what's your heart in this? Can I have some new prayers for this? And one of the things we've just been praying for and asking God for, and I said, Lord, how do I pray? What do I need to do about this? And I felt like the Lord said, don't ask anymore. Just thank me for it. I already gave you the promise many years ago. And this is the year to just thank me for it. And I went, wow. Hmm. Should have thought of that sooner. <laughs> but that's the creativeness of God. When, when you feel like you're just not breaking through, go to his heart. Go into his heart and just ask him. What's up with this? What's new? How can I pray fresh? How can I bring a solution that's fresh? So Holy Spirit, what is new for us today? What is fresh? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.